Thank you, Jen, and welcome, everybody. Uh, good afternoon. Yeah, we're past 12, so I can say good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the third event on the Lunch Time Talk series in the winter quarter. Uh, I know many of you um, I are by now very familiar with the format, but for those of you that are joining us for the first time and for our guests today, I wanted to share a brief intro to the series itself. Um, formerly known as the Third Thursdays, the series began as a means to gather people um, within the AUD community. Um, it was an almost private space to share recent work among our faculty and our students, uh, to share uh, current research topics, uh, and more importantly, to find um, a common ground and to discuss common interests uh, between our community members. The format was purposefully created as an alternative to a keynote lecture. And um, over the past year, uh, most of our faculty have participated in different ways, in groups of two or groups of three, three, but uh, presenting their own work. And at some point, we had an extremely inspiring conversation between Kathy Barkham, who's one of our uh, faculty members at AUD, and Catherine Opie, who's a world-renowned photographer and the chair of the art department here at UCLA. After that event, we decided to open up the series to include faculty in conversation with other faculty outside of AUD, at SOA, at UCLA, and also with outside guests. Um, so within that evolution um, we uh, get to today, I have the pleasure to introduce Dana Kaff and Greg Lean from AUD and Christopher Hawthorne. Um, I always find it interesting to introduce people that need no introduction. Uh, I think a little bit is about understanding uh, not only the sort of individuals, but the context of uh, why and how they come together. Part of that effort, I think I will try to uh, summarize and part will come up in the conversation at the end of the talk. Um, Dr. Dana Kaff is a professor at AUD and the founder and director of UCLA City Lab. She engages spatial justice and cultural studies of architecture as a teacher, as a scholar, as a practitioner, as an activist. Uh, Christopher Hawthorne is Chief Design Officer for the City of Los Angeles and was the architectural critic for the Los Angeles Times from 2004 to 2018. And lastly, Greg Lean is a professor at AUD designing at the intersection of the digital and physical in both architecture and design and design culture in general. He is the founder and owner of Greg Lean Form and the CEO and co-founder of the Boston-based robotics company Piaggio Fast Forward. Um, uh, for today, I wanted to borrow uh, an expression from uh, one of our colleagues at AUD, and I would say that um, Dana, Greg, and Christopher, our three panelists, are in a way public intellectuals, uh, connecting the worlds of design, architecture, and urbanism to larger platforms and audiences. This engagement not only creates space for our disciplines to actively participate in the important conversations and work shaping the future of the but also creates a link to larger, more diverse audiences for which our disciplines operate as broader instruments of culture and everything that comes with that rubric. The title of today's event, Los Angeles Experiments in Mobility and Domesticity, I imagine will be addressed in different ways by three of our panelists, but this is what they collectively agreed on uh, to put forward as the title for uh, today's event. I look forward to hearing the story of how that came to be uh, either in their presentations or in the Q&A at the end of the event. So please join me in giving a Zoom welcome to Dana, Christopher, and Greg. Dana, I, no, Greg, I think I'm passing the microphone to you. I believe you're going to be the first presenter. Oh, okay. Ready. Um, Jen, can you let me screen share? Yes, I'll add you as a co-host right now, Greg. Thanks. Yeah, sorry, I had to log in with a different email. I couldn't get in with my UCLA one. It was. You're here now, and that's what counts, right? Exactly. Okay. The floor oh, is yours. Perfect. Okay, so um, 
I, I brought a few images just to get us thinking. And in, I mean, Christopher and Dana, I obviously know very well. And so I'm sure we're going to have a fun conversation regardless. But one of the things that we all were kind of talking about um, before coming here is that there are different levels of acknowledgement of innovation and experimentation in the city of Los Angeles. And when it comes to mobility, often Los Angeles is approached as a negative example of mobility and innovation. Um, people associate it with terrible traffic. I have to say like Boston's traffic is a million times worse than Los Angeles's. Um, but it, it, there's all kinds of assumptions that go into the city. And I just thought as a kind of a establishing, not a ground truth, but a level for conversation, it would be interesting to talk about some of the things involving mobility that, that have happened in LA. So this is an image um, fairly recent of ATSAC which is the Automated Traffic Surveillance and Control Center of the LA Department of Transportation. It was developed for the 1984 Olympics. I believe it took about six years to do. It is the most sophisticated traffic control system on earth, I believe, much more sophisticated than Uber or Lyft or anything like that. Um, the city of LA can create spaces for public assembly, for protest, for events. They can shut traffic down and reroute traffic very rapidly. It's a, an amazingly robust and, and impressive technological control system that takes into account uh, a vast um, network of traffic lights, um, infrastructure, bus deployment, all kinds of um, transportation into a, a digital era. And it's, if you're a traffic, um, not a traffic planner, but a traffic operator, it, it is like the um, benchmark that you look to for your city. Um, but so this was developed, you know, uh, 40 years ago, <laughs> 38 years ago, something like that. So it's been around for a while. Um, this is just one of those screen images. And you can see that, that all the way back in 1984, um, the, the street and traffic networks were thought of regarding events. So that's Exposition Park. That's one of the main Olympic venues from 1984 um, where the USC stadium is. And they're looking at intersections for pedestrians, traffic, um, and also uh, rail. Since then, other things have been deployed first in Los Angeles. So Los Angeles was the first place that Uber piloted. So um, I, I don't exactly know why. I mean, I know something about sidewalks. I don't know why uh, ride sharing was, was first deployed in, in Los Angeles, but it is the epicenter for the ride sharing phenomenon. And when it came up 12 or 15 years ago, a lot of people were very excited about this new kind of taxi system Uber that was only in Los Angeles. Similarly, Bird Scooters, uh, Bird decided to deploy in Santa Monica as the first site. Um, they, they did it without any permission. One of the interesting things is these are all private companies using public infrastructure um, to deploy new systems of transportation. Um, and, and in a completely initially unregulated way, we might want to talk about what some of those regulations are that make these things um, work better. The other thing I would just point out, which will be a recurring theme in every slide I show, is this person riding in front on the bird scooter is texting on their phone while they're riding. And this, I think, is a theme that you're going to see coming up more and more, um, that actually driving is seen as um, biting into our potential screen time. Um, same thing with, uh, with bike sharing networks, the number of, of electric bike shares in LA per capita is extremely high. It's also where a lot of companies try to compete to find out who can monopolize um, that, that bike sharing here in Los Angeles. 
More recently, you're starting to see sidewalk delivery robots. This is a Postmates robot doing deliveries of convenience and grocery staples uh, for Pink Dot. Also in Santa Monica, um, for the last year, they've, they've had pretty much a, a very friendly um, approach for piloting sidewalk delivery robots. Finally, along comes COVID. Um, and, and what you see is that because of the inability to eat indoors, to collect for concerts and things indoors, streets were taken over um, with outdoor seating for dining, um, with, with all kinds of functions that would have been indoor that were private that suddenly moved outdoors and the, the streets um, were transformed. There's a, there is a desire to maintain a, a, some aspects of, of COVID um, street transformations for the future. And then finally, the other two things that are happening in Los Angeles, it is arguably the center for private automobile design, engineering, and manufacture in the United States. Tesla is the most valuable car company in the world now, was started in, and well, it was started in San Francisco, but, but when Elon Musk took it over, moved to Los Angeles, um, along with things like the Boring Company and all kinds of mobility innovations that are, are based here in Los Angeles, um, but especially electric cars all the way back to the 80s, electric cars were very much a Southern California phenomenon and, and continue to be so. Then finally, you don't see so many of these around, but this is definitely, they're, they're around. I mean, this is the latest Google uh, Waymo self-driving car package that's bolted on top of Jaguar SUVs right now. Um, these, are, these are road testing in various places, but they're, they're road testing in Los Angeles, they're road testing in San Francisco, um, and self-driving cars, it's not that far away that you'll start to see them in Southern California, Los Angeles as well. Um, the one thing I would point out is that these self-driving cars, I, I'm not sure anybody really knows why we need them, but I'll tell you why, I'll tell you who really does want them, uh, Apple. So the self-driving car initiatives were started not by car companies, um, but by advertising and media companies, meaning Apple and Google. Um, I think it's fairly straightforward that that because the average American spends an hour and 37 minutes commuting every day, that if you can have a self-driving car where you're in a bubble and all of the media, entertainment, advertising, and shopping is controlled by one entity like an Apple, um, that's an hour and 37 minutes of your eyeballs that Apple gets um, by building you a self-driving car. So, so that's, for me, these are some of the things that are impacting the city and a lot of the things that are first deployed in Los Angeles as a model and then um, percolate all over. And, and the self-driving cars, by the way, the most US and European car companies don't wanna make self-driving self cars, they just have to, to be competitive. Um, but, it, but it's an initiative that's been generated by Google and Apple. It's not an initiative that's been generated by the car companies, because frankly, it's clear it'll increase traffic, it'll make longer commutes more acceptable, and people live further and further away from where they work. And um, anyway, so those are a few images just to kind of get us talking. Thanks, Greg. Uh, wow, uh, the idea of like even more screen time is kind of frightening. Um, let me put up my desktop. Do you see that? Uh, maybe you see it totally. Okay, is that good? Great. Um, so uh, I don't know, but I'm sure we're gonna talk about this at the end. Uh, we're each talking for about 10 minutes about different aspects of experiments in mobility and domesticity in Los Angeles. and. I'm taking on domesticity and thinking about the connections, about the kinds of things Greg was talking about, of uh, how mobility has shaped domesticity here in Los Angeles and, um, and where I see that going now. Um, and I think I don't quite know 
where our next stage will be in relationship to mobility, which is why I'm so interested in this conversation. Surely in the post-war period, the um, conventional wisdom and stereotype about Los Angeles is between the car and the single family house. And photographers like Ansel Adams and William Garnett turned that into something truly sublime, I think, in their aerial photographs. That sub sublime notion of freeways and suburbs is now completely gone. But during the 40s and 50s, um, it really was also the inspiration for our discipline in architecture to take on some of its most innovative tasks. Um, the French uh, painter and uh, trained as an architect, Jean Hélion, uh, made a claim that I think most architects believed at the time that the all of architecture was really driven by the problem of the house. And the most well-known of those kinds of uh, architecture problems was set forward by the Arts and Architecture magazine under the case study house rubric. And even here, you see this kind of future Los Angeles of an infinite expanse of land with a Jeep and a helicopter being the ways you access uh, a space that was isolated and yet connected through different kinds of individual transportation. Um, it wasn't just the case study houses that made Los Angeles a leader in the sort of uh, custom home, uh, you know, remarkable housing industry. John Lautner's Chemosphere has appeared in many movies and really was the kind of inspiration for the Jetsons as well as for um, Charlie's Angels and, and a kind of skyline that Los Angeles built through the architecture of individual houses. What we've become more aware of recently is how that a uh, skyline and individual house was really built on the backs of communities of color and the residents who were already in Los Angeles. Um, and really that was most apparent when we started uh, looking at large scale assemblies or aggregations of houses like the Elysian Park Heights proposal from Richard Neutra in the 50s, same era as the case study house program and the chemisphere house a utopian scheme that was to sit where a uh, thousand houses, uh, primarily Latinx occupants were uh, by, um, you know, demolition and forced removal, uh, cleared the site, as you can see documented in Judy Baca's Great Wall of Los Angeles, um, eventually making way for Dodger Stadium, not for the housing that Neutra had originally proposed. And this fraught and violent history, I think leads to what I would like to propose for our conversation is the new formulation of domesticity in Los Angeles, that all of architecture is colored and that word now is freighted, uh, might be even thought of as racialized by the problem of housing. So I might even go so far if it was uh, provocative to say that the single family house is dead as an architectural project. Instead, I think if we're thinking about housing, uh, City Lab and lots of other people, uh, including the people that are here on this screen and Greg and Christopher in particular, have been thinking about what it means to rethink uh, the landscape of the city in regards to housing. At City Lab, we think of it kind of in this diagram at the moment, that it starts with some kind of research, goes through prototyping, has to be published so that it becomes part of a public dialogue, and eventually leads to lawmaking or legislation. Um, I think that's an attempt to try to avoid the egregious harm that uh, architecture proposals like the Chavez Reen one or actions have um, done in the past. Uh, at City Lab, the most effective uh, and complete cycle of that uh, way of thinking through experiments in housing that are happening here in Los Angeles was really through the co authoring of state legislation that um, permitted accessory dwelling units or granny flats. And I'm, you know, really proud to be a partner with Christopher Hawthorne, who took another step in the ADU legislation to make 
the uh, standard plan program where you see uh, one of our own faculty members, Chris, uh, Cristobal Amunadegui's um, submission uh, into pre-approved plans at the LA Building and Safety Department where homeowners can retrieve those plans already approved for structures and other forms of uh, entitlements and then customize them to be um, built in their own backyards. Los Angeles now is though thought of as the mother of the suburbs is actually one of the first cities to end single family zoning through its ADU legislation and a leader in uh, thinking in the construction of these. In California, we've built far more uh, secondary units than in any other city in the state. Maybe um, the next evolution of those kind of experiments, and one that I think is especially interesting, is SB9, which only came into law at the start of this year, where not just doubling the density like the ADU law permitted, but double allows a homeowner to subdivide the lot two different owners now and each of those two lots can now have two units meaning we've quadrupled the density and halved the ownership which is in a way um redressing some of the you know uh problems that suburbs uh really exposed in terms of redlining and racialized uh, differentials in wealth and the pushing particularly black uh, residents out of suburban ownership. Um, this is again something that was taken up in Christopher's uh, work at the low rise uh, competition and I think points to the fact that we're going to need new architectures maybe you'd say of this single family lot, not the single family house, to understand what it means to build four units where we used to build one pavilion in the garden. Um, and uh, another piece of legislation, if we think that really where the intersection of innovation in architecture and domesticity happens now is in land use uh, research, uh, community and uh, new forms of infill building uh, and architecture. The one that's uh, we've just finished at City Lab and is moving through committees at the state now is AB 2295, which if it passes through all of the required processes would permit the construction of affordable housing, particularly for teachers and other employees at schools, from janitors to cafeteria workers on existing school land. And it turns out there's an equivalent of something like 10 Manhattans worth of land in the California public schools alone. So this too will require architects to think innovatively uh, and comes out of this research comes out of uh, work we've undertaken related to how architecture could respond. So a final provocation I would have for our conversation later is that um, some of these measures might not be leading to the kind of architecture that we think makes a better city. And this is the transit oriented communities legislation that passed in 2016 in Los Angeles, uh, which really increases the density around high traffic uh, transit stops, um, like our metro system, like the one coming to UCLA at Westwood. Um, and I'm hoping maybe Christopher is gonna have some answers to this problem, because I think one of the key issues is how these buildings meet the street and looking at that intersection between the infrastructure of sidewalks uh, and the housing itself, which um, maybe it was a problem with the legislation, maybe it's a problem in the way we're training architects today, uh, but I think it's something that we really have to scrutinize um, if we're planning to take on new innovations in housing and think about them in terms of the architectural results they produce. So with that, I hand it over to you, Christopher. 
Thank you so much, Dana. Um, really great to be in conversation with both of you. And I think I'm so glad you mentioned the work on legislation. I just have so much admiration for the advocacy and policy work you have done um, with with really fantastic results and continuing to look ahead um, as we, yes, as we um, put a final nail in the coffin of the single family houses, the, particularly the locus of architectural experimentation. Um, I think that's long overdue. Um, I will, um, while you were mentioning, let me just bring up my slides. While you were mentioning the, um, the Ralph Rapson house, I'm so glad you showed that. So I was feverishly working uh, back here um, to find <laughs> this Esther McCoy quote, which I, which I did find, um, which is one of my favorites of hers. Uh, which I think is very germane to this conversation. She says that uh, the rendering of the house showed a helicopter hovering over the roof as if the owner was coming home to the suburbs. His wife is waving to him. Where is she? Hanging out diapers. Um, Rapson's money was on the wrong machine, which I just love. Um, again, uh, uh, an, a useful kind of cautionary tale about the predictions we make about the future. And in Rapson's case, um, betting that we'd have helicopters before we had washers and dryers in people's houses. Um, always one of my favorite McCoy quotes. So I, you know, I bring a certain amount of skepticism about um, autonomous driving, self-driving, and, and I'm glad Greg mentioned the kind of bottom line um, drivers of these, of these changes. But there has been, uh, given that my focus will be on the intersection of these two subjects, um, uh, mobility and domesticity, where they come together, there has been in projections about uh, autonomous vehicles, um, a, a, a pretty big dose of uh, this idea of domesticity, particularly that our cars could turn into could turn into into living rooms, um, if not also to bedrooms um, and dining rooms, uh, all of which will have screens screens, I'm, I'm quite sure. Uh, but the reality on the ground in Los Angeles, of course, is quite a bit grimmer um, than that. And one thing I think is important to mention right off the bat is just the where we see the intersection of uh, mobility and domesticity most directly in Los Angeles, of course, is in um, what experts on homelessness call vehicular homelessness, which is, of course, people living out of their cars. And as a result, we have both at the city and county level been promoting the idea of safe parking lots, of which there are now more than a couple of dozen. Um, and uh, Council Member Bonin, of course, in particular, has been uh, a leading advocate for those uh, those sites in, in, uh, in Los Angeles. Um, and that's this is typically what they look like, very straightforward, um, with a couple of attendants and, and, uh, and spaces um to to park vehicles safely overnight um of course as we think about the intersection of mobility and domesticity in the suburban um let's say imagination it's the garage where that is not only happening most directly and most literally but also in many subdivisions in southern california as is true acro across the country you have the garage uh, really front and center um, in terms of an ar architectural expression or the place where the um, where the the idea of residential architecture meets the public realm. Um, and uh, the this is a, a still from Freaks and Geeks. There are scenes in a bunch of movies where people are in a landscape like the one I just showed and and, and forget which house is their own until they um, use their garage door opener uh, to find their way. And in this case, one of the kids in Freaks and Geeks is, suspects that his dad is having an affair and somehow gets the um, garage door opener and rides around with his friends on bikes until, sure enough, they open a garage door um, at a, a house that's unfamiliar to him to see his dad's, I think, a red Corvette um, behind, uh, behind the door. Um, and the image that I showed first was from a recent New York Times article about how supply chain problems actually are um, hitting uh, subdivision builders of the present day, most specifically um, in terms of garage door availability. So there are a bunch of houses. These are in and around Sacramento for the most part, pictured in that New York Times piece, uh, where the entire tract house is done except for the garage door, which is uh, probably sitting at the port or um, on a on a container ship somewhere. 
And of course, that that image of plywood suggests, I think, to many of us, the way in which um, Frank Gehry in his own house wrapped um, along with chain link and corrugated metal used plywood um, right at the front door, sort of in place of that um, of that garage. Um, in the larger kind of cultural imagination of Los Angeles and California and the United States more broadly, the garage has been sort of a mythic place of invention. The image at left is the garage where Hewlett Packard was founded in uh, Palo Alto, a house I looked it up on Zillow now, uh, estimated value of, I think, $5.5 million. Um, uh, and then, of course, the garage band uh, is not only part of that myth making, but it has given its name to uh, to music software. By this point, um, locally, the most famous example might be Mark Marin's uh, podcast studio in a converted garage in Highland Park, where he interviewed uh, Barack Obama, among others. He has since sold that house and moved into a new studio. But when he did put the house on the market, that was a big part of the um, the pitch in the in the listing. Uh, and more recently, of course, as as Dana was suggesting, we have seen a significant number of conversions of uh, garages into ADUs. Um, thanks in part to the advocacy that I was mentioning um, from Dana and many of her colleagues, um, the, the specific uh, relaxation of parking requirements through garage conversion in particular has been a really important part of the uptake. Um, and thank you for mentioning the standard plan program um, that launched uh, a little less than a year ago and we um, have seen a, a, actually quite a bit of uptake on those designs in the last few weeks. And there's a, a researcher doing uh, planning a course on ADU production across the country. Um, and we shared some numbers with him this morning. And he said, according to his research, our standard plan program is the most heavily subscribed in the, in the country, which was very good to hear. Um, there are about a dozen such programs in cities around the country, mostly up and down the West Coast. Um, but again, this is really where uh, progress in um, at this intersection is going to is going to continue to come. Is really thinking about where the cars go and where the parking requirements go. As we think about moving, as Dana said, from the second and third unit to the fourth, fifth, sixth, or, or eighth unit uh, in these low rise neighborhoods. Important, though, to remember the dingbat, which is probably the best example uh, of this direct incorporation of parking. And this looks like one that has been retrofitted, that these are not particularly seismically secure buildings. Many of them are being uh, retrofitted, and we have a program to do that across the city of L.A. But this um, direct kind of full frontal uh, integration of parking is an important part of the um, the way that we all think of the, the kind of classic dingbat um, elevation. Um, and uh, that is now bound up in all kinds of ways in our housing crisis. This is a recent um, tweet from Warren Wells about the dingbat over Tesla um, typology, which is uh, uh, often a sign of our, of our housing crisis. Um, it is much easier to afford what we think of as a luxury car than anything close to uh, luxury housing. Um, but SB9 really is the, the current frontier in helping us think through the SB9, um, which earlier was called SB1120. It is a sort of a downshifted version of more aggressive uh, legislation uh, to upzone single family neighborhoods that began with um, proposals like SB50 and SB827. So what I'm showing you here is the first page of our so-called implementation me memo from the Department of City Planning, which went out in um, uh, in February uh, to give some guidance both to the planning department and to uh, to homeowners about what the implementation of SB9 would look like in, in Los Angeles, of course, every city in uh, California is doing something similar at the moment. You may have read that uh, the, the city of um, uh, um, what city was it in Silicon Valley, which claimed an exception, uh, Woodside, uh, claimed an exception to SB9, a blanket exception, because they tried to declare the entire city a mountain lion protected habitat. They, after a significant backlash, um, did retreat from that, and they are now preparing their own um, SB9 implementation memo. But um, again, this is these are the key, for a conversation like this, really the key parts of the policy about um, relaxed parking 
Um, uh, no additional parking is allowed to be imposed if the site is within walking distance of a high quality transit corridor, a major transit stop, and then also wanted to point out point two here, um, or if it's uh, within a block of a car share vehicle drop off. So I'll be very interested to see both how this works in terms of uh, enforcement and whether we see as a result of this detail in SB9 um, some new locations or expansion of locations for car share uh, vehicle drop off and pick up um, as, as people look to um, develop more uh, SB9 parcels. And then just wanted to mention two quick things in closing. Um, Dana was nice enough to mention the low rise um, competition, which really was anticipating in, in one of its categories in particular um, that something like SB9 might become law by this year. Um, we had a category that allowed the subdivision of lots in the, in the way that SB9 does. Um, and then in the other categories, this is the winner in the so-called corners competition, which um, category, I should say, which has a which called for a, a community space or a retail space at the corner. Just thinking again about thinking back to that image of the classic suburban street with that row of garage doors and thinking about how I think why th uh, this kind of proposal appealed to the jury so much and to the communities that we've had discussions with about the low rise winners is just that it's a much different interface or interaction between the sidewalk and the and the kind of residential sphere and even a zone of sort of in-between space that can be both public or private or be part of a threshold between public and private space in terms of, in this case, a community center at the corner. And if you look at the elevation, there are sites for parking, um, but they don't dominate visually or in terms of square footage. Um, we gave the competitors a fair amount of leeway to help us rethink parking. But what we heard in the community engagement that we did which was quite extensive before we launched the competition, was that uh, many, many Angelinos, if not a, a clear majority of folks we talked to, uh, were willing to consider giving up some of the um, uh, some of the convenience of having you know one or two parking spaces for every unit, if it meant that there would be some benefits to them in terms of first and foremost, of course, housing affordability, but also community cohesion, the ability to age in place, the ability to have densities that are sufficient to support walkable retail, for example, within a neighborhood. And I think I think COVID has really clarified a lot of this for, for us. We've had a chance to be at home for two years uh, or been forced, uh, as the case may be, to be at home. And we've had a lot of opportunity to kind of analyze our own neighborhoods and our own domestic situation and what we're able to walk to and what is not within walking distance. And I think that is another element of building the, the really emerging constituency we see for these kinds of changes where if there were this is a uh, uh, an eight unit project if they're across two single family lots if you have eight units and maybe you had space for four six or eight cars but you might have some car share within walking distance or a distributed parking model um, in addition to the car share um, that Greg mentioned and public transit so if you had some combination of all of those so there is some private vehicle ownership um, but it's re it's reduced in terms of the space it's taking up on the lot, um, and it's mixed together with a number of other mobility options. And I think there is growing support for that kind of solution among Angelinos. And then we brought together, um, in conjunction with uh, USC in a program where I teach at USC, and the third LA series, a symposium called Pump to Plug, which was imagining uh, the future, in part imagining the future of the 550 or 600 gas station locations in the city of Los Angeles um, as we navigate the transition to electric vehicles. Um, and many of the proposals, this is one from the firm Wood, Woods Baggett, um, was imagining how many of those sites might be after remediation, of course, converted to housing. Um, so it's not just about where the cars go on a former single family lot. It's also about wh what happens to the mobility infrastructure of the 20th century. And so we've been trying to get um, uh, move the conversation forward about what a an aggregate or a comprehensive strategy might look like for imagining the future of gas station sites, whether that's conversion to parks and open space, which are much needed in many communities, or uh, in the case of this proposal, uh, housing. So I will leave it there. Look forward to the conversation. Thanks so much. Thanks, Christopher. Uh, Greg, 
so I was thinking while Chris was talking, like in his images of the autonomous vehicles, there's it's like a house, like a like the Airstream trailer in a way was meant for multiple people. I wonder after thinking through the private vehicle, it, it's absolutely going to require some kind of collective uh, activity with the car, not just in sharing vehicles, but somehow rethinking Tesla so that it's not just me and my Tesla or you and yours, but that we can somehow uh, collectivize that as well. Otherwise, we're still stuck with this house and the car together, aren't we? I mean, everything you said to me up till the point of the Tesla was like, oh yeah, okay, I'm gonna wipe out the single family home and Greg's getting rid of the car, this is great. Like, okay, we're done. Well, it's, yeah, um, look, I'm not an expert. I would say it's very much a last gasp. Um, it, and frankly, when, when, when you showed that Rapson image of, let's say a certain kind of wilderness, which is adjacent to the metropolis, I mean, that's definitely the, the fantasy and for some people, the reality of Los Angeles. Um, I, I've been kind of watching what's happening with the great resignation, um, which is more kind of baby boomers in the end than it is younger people. Um, but but the, the younger people that are choosing a different work-life balance are, are looking for this kind of, you know, more rural than suburban living situation within two hours of work where they might go for two days a week. And they're looking to work for maybe three days a week, one day at home, then whatever it is, skiing, walking their new dogs, whatever it is for the, for the other days a week. Um, and what will power that will be cars that make a two hour, three hour commute more um, tolerable. And I don't know if that means com a community of people in a car or if it just means much more single, single driver cars. But, but I, I think also the, the cost of these things, um, you know, it's incredibly expensive to, to make an electric car, let alone a self-driving electric car. So I don't know. I, I think it's going to have a very big impact on um, the demographics and the, you know, the kind of the, the, you know, what's gonna happen to the suburbs and the exurbs and the, the mountains, you know, around Los Angeles. And it'll be the place where it gets experimented on. It's set up for it. I mean, if, if you say, where's the fantasy for living in the woods or the mountains and commuting to your tech job two to three hours away, it's Los Angeles. So, I yeah. mean, I think we just need to be ready for it and get ahead of it somehow. I was kind of heartened, Christopher, to hear you say that uh, in those community listening sessions, people were willing to think about giving up their cars. I mean, I think when we began the ADU research, uh, we were accused of trying to Manhattanize Los Angeles by thinking of a rental unit in the garage. And I've heard people say similarly about their cars, like we'll never give up our cars, but I'll bet you in our audience right here, there are a lot of people who don't have one and who are, yeah, I see people raising their hands. Thanks, Tucker. Um, like most of the people that work at City Lab don't have cars anymore. My kids don't have cars. It's uh, inspiring and almost unspoken given how dedicated the city has been to preserving the last bastion of the private car. Right. There's still there is still some political work to do. So as with SB9, I mean, we see anytime there's a poll about upzoning single family neighborhoods, you know, we find we find clear and consistent majorities who are interested in policy changes like SB9. And at the same time, when the city council has weighed in, they have expressed almost unanimous, almost consistently unanimous uh, opposition to any such reform. And similar, and I mentioned that because something similar is going on with parking reform. So I think um, particularly younger Angelinos, it's not exclusively a generational shift, but that's part of what's happening. Understand that particularly as we think about not just our housing affordability goals, but particularly our climate goals, 
we're simply not going to reach them until we begin to locate uh, housing more intelligently and really think with a sense of urgency about how to do that. And they are much more willing than I think the political class, let's say, traditionally in the last few decades in Los Angeles has been willing to do to talk about trade offs and say, there's certain things I would like to see my neighborhood have that I don't have right now. Um, and I'm willing to think about trade offs and things that, I'm, again, I'm willing to give up a little bit of convenience uh, in terms of always having a private vehicle waiting for me within steps of my front door. Um, if you had to walk a little bit further to a distributed um, parking location or shared vehicle um, location in your neighborhood, but it meant that you had room for two more units in your household, one of which you could rent out and one of which could be a place to uh, work from home or to quarantine uh, or to move your mother-in-law in, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think there is a growing willingness to talk about those trade-offs and willingness to make those trade-offs, particularly among younger Angelinos. And the pandemic, again, really clarified a lot of this. We have one of the highest proportions of multi-generational households in Los Angeles of any American city, but our single family zoning in particular is quite rigid. So we talked in the outreach for low rise, much less about density and much more about flexibility. Uh, and there is a really poor fit between uh, the desire, um, sometimes multi-generational households are living together out of nece economic necessity, but also um, out, of, out of desire uh, to be able to have older relatives age in place and be part of an extended family household or compound, for example. And so there is increasingly, I think, a desire to see a zoning and land use approach that matches that way that people either live now quasi successfully or would like to live and they would like to see the city uh, offer some more options that reflect um, re reflect all those realities. I really if, thought, go ahead, Greg. No, I was also gonna say that, that there are a lot of um, micro mobility accessible trips in Los Angeles. I don't know the data, but I do know nationally in the US, three and a half trips a day for errands is the norm. So five and a half trips total that somebody will make, two of those are for commuting to work and the other three and a half are for errands. And micromobility takes up about a quarter of those and, and walking is micromobility. So walking, bicycle, scooter, you know, two slow two wheeled devices. Um, Los Angeles, I think the reason micromobility gets piloted here um, I know one reason is we're one of the only cities in America where you can ride a bicycle on a sidewalk. And so that means you can go 15 miles an hour on a sidewalk in LA legally, and you can't do that many places. So that's clearly one reason it was tried. They bird scooters were pushed off the sidewalk soon after they were piloted, but that's one reason they looked at Los Angeles. I think the other reason is a lot of neighborhoods are highly walkable. And, and, and those, by the way, those, those errands that are not micromobility serviced in the U.S. on average, they're under two miles, each one of them. So two miles is a little bit of a stretch to walk, um, especially if you have to carry stuff. But it, it does mean that, that neighborhoods in L.A. are one of the reasons people pilot in Santa Monica, L.A. You know, it, there's a lot of places where people live and do a lot of their, their errands and school and all that stuff close. Well, it, it makes me think of that aerial photograph you showed with all the cafes and sort of traffic slowing uh, bump outs. Why is it that we can't get oh, bike lanes? I mean, I realize Culver City struggled through all the resistance to get that extra bike lane. But, you know, why can't we lessen the traffic lanes by one step. I think we have one of the most innovative transportation leaders in Salida Reynolds in the country. And that would be in the way you're both talking about it, a first step towards transforming uh, transit to micro mobilities, you know, and making those more comfortable and uh, accessible, which would then, you know, maybe push the car for those longer trips um, the Los Angeles rural edge or whatever, uh, then those trips could be shared. But yep. 
maybe until we get the streets figured out, um, that's not really possible because it's pretty unpleasant riding a bike on our streets, uh, kind of harrowing in many cases. Um, absolutely. There is a huge amount of work on that front that we need to do. And there, you know, the, the short answer to your question is that there continues to be a lot of political blowback, um, re even recall mm -hmm. efforts that have come directly out of, I'm thinking of a couple instances on the West side in particular. Um, and again, this sort of conventional wisdom as with, um, uh, as with density zoning land use, um, is an expectation that that you know we have trained angelinos this is something i thought and wrote a lot about at the times and certainly think and work on a lot in my in my new job um we have trained angelinos over more than five decades to expect that the city will continually re be redesigned to make car travel more efficient and i was interested to hear what craig said about traffic in boston there is not that expectation on other cities that in fact traffic is often seen as a sign globally of economic vitality, you don't expect that you'll be able to drive from Long Island to New Jersey through Manhattan um, and have streets that have been redesigned to make that commute uh, more efficient, right? For you as a solo driver, there's still very much that expectation in Los Angeles among the LA media. Um, the way that we think of traffic as being news, for example, four or five minutes, I think of every hour, even on public radio is dedicated to traffic updates. I mean, putting aside the fact that everybody can get those on their phone, that mindset, I think, is reflected in the idea that 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 goes back to the SIG alert model, that it, it is it is news, according to this uh, conventional wisdom, if traffic is congested and the typical um, the typical state, uh, natural state of things is is a lack of congestion, where, of course, in every other big city in the world, the the, the precise opposite is true. So we are at the moment um, beginning to think about what um, this outdoor dining, I'm glad Greg showed that image, what we call the Alfresco program will be, is being made permanent. And we're thinking about some kind of design standards or guidelines that could go along with that. It, it, it was, um, took advantage of emergency, um, state of, you know, sort of emergency state, a declaration from uh, the mayor that allowed us to move with relatively minimal red tape, and we're hoping to continue to make the program relatively easy. And you're right that we have an innovative DOT, but when it comes to bike lanes, uh, particularly fully protected bike lanes, um, there has not been the same willingness, particularly at the council level, um, to install that kind of infrastructure in ways that we need. But I completely agree this, given the climate and the, the flatness of most of the basin, this should be a, an absolute, absolute world capital of, uh, of cycling. Well, you know, I think what both of you have talked about changing the mindset here, the conventional wisdom is so uh, archaic in a way and so impossible to dislodge that even as walkable neighborhoods are the most desirable by all measures, there's still some contingent of people who think that if you take away a, one garage from a house that you've like uh, done something that should send you directly to hell. So I, I don't know how those two things get together. You know, in the case of the ADU law, we moved past local uh, participation because the loudest voices were the most conservative property owners, uh, primarily white property owners, who were restricting uh, what was already going on informally across the city. And I think, you know, in some ways that, you know, rem a change in the way we think about local participation is another aspect of this, where really, like, literally people are voting with their feet when they want to live where you can walk. I see we have a few questions. Maybe we'll open this up a bit. Um, somebody asked at the very beginning, uh, are there books on this kind of thing or, or articles uh, about new forms of mobility, new forms of uh, the intersection between mobility and domesticity, new forms of domesticity that would guide some of the um, thinking about this that you would recommend? You know, I'm a big fan of the census. <laughs> I, <think. laughs> I mean, I, I mean, one of the things that I think is so impressive about um, Christopher and Dana, your presentations is 
legislation as well as land use. I mean, I, I don't know where I heard it, but I, I heard the best traffic plan is a good land use plan. And, and I think that actually those kinds of documents that are all publicly accessible are incredibly interesting. Um, just because it does cut through a lot of the assumptions. And, and I think one of the things we've all seen is that there are a lot of assumptions about the city that just are not actually accurate anymore, maybe. I think the uh, the book that Jeanette Sadek Khan wrote called Street Fight, which is about her experience trying to push for a lot of these changes in New York City um, when she was running the Department of Transportation there is worth reading. Um, and it, it does address a lot of the questions, the points you raised, Dana, about um, about uh, community conversations and how to avoid um, only listening to the loudest voices or the wealthiest voices in, in the room. I think the, you know, in terms of land use and housing policy specifically, um, and increasingly in terms of uh, mobility and freeway construction, there has been a lot of really great scholarship. And I think when we, you know, the conversations we're having in community meetings are much more aware of that history now than they were even three or four years ago. So understanding the histories of um, redlining, racist lending practices, the fact that, I mean, these are things that, that I never learned in my education about uh, architecture or cities. You know, the fact that the GI Bill essentially was not available to home buyers of color, for example, um, when we were all learning a, a, learning about it as a kind of foundation of the American dream, right? So, um, and then the wildfires and climate change have also clarified um, the need to, again, think with a good deal more urgency here. So we, we have found it, and really the whole framing of low rise was designed to move toward a more productive conversation. Um, but that's been really helped by a, a lot of really good scholarship um, that's been produced lately. I would also say the, a lot, the work that Anne Hidalgo, the mayor of Paris, has been doing is quite um, very much an inspiration, um, uh, particularly in terms of bicycle mobility. Um, uh, but but the there's just a lot more awareness of a need for a new set of paradigms, I think, and even in even in the, some of the more traditional community engagement you know settings. Now, how quickly that begins to translate to different policy at let's say the city council level on the land use questions is a you know is another matter. Um, I'm struck by the fact that the three of us are all forms of architect that don't fit into a traditional model. Um, and I wonder if the students that are on the webinar are wondering like, where would they fit into this kind of forward thinking? I think maybe that idea that, you know, architecture could be actually about things like uh, the sidewalk and the street design and the land use policy is in a way what each of you, uh, as well as me, um, are trying to shift in terms of the conventional thinking also about architecture. And if we don't do that, we're stuck with the infrastructures that came to us from the 1950s for the most part, at least in Los Angeles, actually some from the turn of the century since we know our downtown grid is much older than that. But. Um, we have another question that's an interesting one. I think it goes to you, Greg. If individuals are avoiding driving personal vehicles and instead devoting that time to screen times, do you think as designers, we can come up with a system that makes mobility act as a catalyst to bring communities together and create portable neighborhoods? Hmm. That's well, a architectural question. I mean, I, I didn't show any of what we're doing at Piaggio fast forward with technology, but I mean, we're, we're making robots with a 20 mile range to just encourage people to do more local shopping, more local errands, um, you know, to do more walking. And it's, it's because we care about the environment and, and a small electric robot is even, and walking is even better than riding a, an electric bike or hailing a, a ride share. Um, but, but mostly it's just because your quality of life is so much better, whether you're an aging person or 
a young, healthy person to be in contact with familiar strangers, to have contact with local shop owners. It's also just a very desirable thing for people to live in a place where they have, you know, five different kinds of ethnic restaurants and a farmer's market and a local hardware store, and they know the names of some people. And it's just that kind of familiar contact breeds um, mental health and happiness. And, and so it's, you know, it, I, I'm really not as, as pessimistic um, about things because I do think if you look at Los Angeles, you know, when somebody comes to visit and they say, I spent my whole time driving around to see this thing and that thing, it's like, well, you miss the fact that there's, you know, 50 neighborhoods here that you needed to see and you need to just park up in the neighborhood and go for a walk and you're going to find out like a very diverse, amazing culture here. And, and so I, I do think that where people choose to live, they are doing that already. I think it's really about where people work and where they live. And, and that's a little bit up for grabs right now after COVID. A lot of people are reluctant to go back to that commute. Yeah, some, somebody makes that comment. Christopher, were you gonna add something? I, to that? I think that's a really important point because the, there are a lot of encouraging trends um, um, in terms of people realizing the relationship between land use and walkability and understanding that if they want retail, particularly um, small scale, non-chain retail within walking distance, they're going to have to have higher residential densities in their neighborhood to support that, to say nothing of, of um, densities that will support uh, transit use at the levels that we would like to see. So that's very encouraging. And I think there, there has been a real shift in the general mindset um, in the last, just last couple of years on that front. But pushing against that is this change in how we think about work and the possibility of autonomy, which Greg is raising, because that has the potential to begin pulling back in the direction of sprawl if people really only have to be in the office once or twice a week and maybe they can do something else while their car drives them. Um, so that the changes in work patterns um, and what all that means, you know, the, there is a version of the of a change of work that really does fit very productively into these more positive changes where people are, are working, you know, a good chunk of the time from home. Um, and if they're not in the mountains and maybe they have a shorter commute that they can do by public transit again um, on the two or three days they have to go into the office, that begins to push us in a much more positive direction. I like to pick up on something you said about the small scale retail. And for sure, that's one of the problems with the transit oriented communities, podium style building developments is that ground floor, like street activation is such large retail space that it kind of kills the sidewalk. Is it because small scale retail is just a romantic fiction that has to fit into old style urban fabrics and developers are unwilling to build that? Or could we somehow uh, create conditions in which that might be reinserted into the mixed use housing developments that are pretty exciting otherwise. Yeah, it's a great question. And sometimes the policy world just moves more slowly than the markets. And, and the, the way that retail has shifted with so much retail going online, of course, that's accelerated by the pandemic, everybody sitting at home and ordering everything. That's why we have the supply chain. That's why people don't have garage doors um, in part. Um, <laughs> and so a requirement that seemed like smart urbanism 10 years ago to require activating right the ground floor with retail in a in a mixed use project or a residential project now might just guarantee an empty dead space right because we don't have the same retail demand that we had a decade ago or even five years ago um, so it's about in in the larger sense it's about being more nimble and flexible about those requirements which we you know there was a real consensus a decade ago that that was a smart urbanistic approach to require that um, but having as portland has done there's some other cities have done that actually requiring a stoop or a part of a residential um, uh, use that activates the sidewalk rather than retail can be more successful while at the same time threading very small scale retail like the corner store back into low rise neighborhoods. And, and there is a there is a pretty close policy coordination between what we're exploring in low rise 
um, and uh, the updates of the community plans, for example, some of which the Boyle Heights um, uh, community plan does uh, include a call for the reintroduction or re-legalization of corner stores. And we heard consistently in our community engagement for low rise, there was almost virtually 100% support for that idea that you could have a grocery store in your, even in your, your single family or low rise multifamily neighborhood. Are the little delivery robots helping that, Greg? I mean, that's- no. It's no. so funny. I've been, I was going to bring it up. I thought it was just too much and maybe too depressing. But the other thing LA is kind of ground zero for is cloud kitchens and ghost kitchens, which yeah. are two very different things. But, you know, the, the cloud kitchen is just a giant warehouse where you just turn out 25 different restaurants worth of food for delivery. A ghost kitchen is, say, Cantor's Deli has a couple of ghost kitchens where they cook the same food as a Cantor's Deli, but there's no seating, there's no storefront. They only do it just to supply Uber Eats and DoorDash drivers to deliver food locally. So one, one is about kind of atomizing kitchens and restaurants into anonymous spaces. The other is consolidating them into almost like fulfillment centers for mega food delivery, um, the way Amazon would. Two totally different approaches, like GoPuff versus uh, Amazon. But um, those things, that's what the delivery robots are powered by, are those two, those two things, not necessarily restaurants. So, um, I mean, I know, Christopher, this is ridiculous, but the way Mayor Hidalgo and Khan are saying Paris and London should be car free, the best thing you could do would not to be focus on the car, but focus on the phone. Like if you could get phone free regions where you're not assuming you can call up anything you want from your phone in an hour, um, it would totally change transportation in LA. What do you mean a phone free region? Like well, you, you have a whole traffic dispatch service with Uber on your phone. You have, you know, ability to order food, convenience products. Amazon products, everyone just, the big change is actually not the automobile. It's, it's these little televisions with, with the ability to summon whatever you want, you know, just being able to call a car and know that it knows where you are because of GPS totally changes taxi stands and bus shelters. And it, it means that everywhere you're deploying transportation with no logic at all or picking up, you know, a push scooter and knowing where it is on your phone and dropping it anywhere you want, it's just, you know, it's the Wild West. Right. Or setting a whole fleet of Amazon trucks in motion from from inside your house. I, I agree. I think it's a really good point. We've all sort of patted ourselves on the back during the pandemic about how we've all been driving less. We're staying home. Meanwhile, though, <laughs> we're using our phones to send a bunch of um, a bunch of trucks and cars uh and summoning them to our houses, we're sort of, um, and, and that traffic is out of sight, out of mind, because we don't see it. The thing just shows up on our on our front doorstep. So um, that's a, a very interesting point. The beauty of uh, Jeanette Sadek Khan's street fight model, though, might apply to this too, which is like she basically temporarily with paint and plastic chairs shut down streets, which didn't cause a lot of political outcry until people saw how much they liked it or how well it worked or whether traffic would still function before they hardened the solutions into permanent street closures. And it seems like with uh, the mobility of the phone, we could do all kinds of experiments, you know, like the geofencing of uh, bikes from like the beach boardwalks because people were getting pushed off by all the traffic. And in a way, it's so easy to remove or replace given that it's controlled by a remote app. Why couldn't we do experiments? Is that going to come from Elon Musk and uh, Apple or do we- I don't know the details, but Salita tried. I mean- LA said no Ubers if you don't give us your data and let you regulate the data. I don't know whatever happened of that, but there was that like week and a half where you couldn't get all that stuff. <laughs> right. And and the the you know the the political calculus here is always important. I mean, Anna Anna Hidalgo in Paris is a really good example. She faced tremendous 
uh, blowback when she first began making those changes. And then when she was running for re-election, really made the case that um, that this was her platform or this was central to her platform, particularly looking ahead to Paris hosting the Olympics in 2024. Um, and so now she's operating with a different kind of a mandate. Um, but even in Paris, I mean, in, in New York, certainly in Los Angeles, even more so the, the, the kind of blowback that you face as an elected official continues to be significant based on the, the kind of conventional wisdom that we were we were talking about and who is able to have a, a, a kind of platform or a bullhorn um, to to complain versus what we see is as growing numbers of folks who are interested in a much different model. So there's a question that's really related to what you just said, Christopher, which is how do we start changing those mindsets? Is it through um, you know projects like low rise or street fights or I mean, maybe it's what we usually say is it's all of the above, but maybe that's a cop out. Well, we really we really felt in putting low rise together that this is a hearts and minds issue, or at least it has been and, and will continue to be that there was this gap between uh, what we saw in public opinion surveys and the way that elect officials were voting um, and that we wanted to elevate the conversation that was you know more thoughtful and more urgent about the necessity of making these kinds of changes. There's also a kind of structural model. I mean, I think as many as many members of the audience will know, um, the, amount, the amount of land use authority and the amount of transportation policy authority that runs through individual council offices in Los Angeles is unusually high. So um, uh, we have relatively few council members per cap, given the size of the city compared to cities like New York or Chicago. Um, so I think that uh, it, it really, changes it, it's about changes to what those elected officials and their planning deputies are hearing in terms of uh, what communities would like to see um, and there has been a, a real there's been real growth in the kind of advocacy both in the pro housing and in, in the transportation model um, that has begun to chip away at that paradigm i mean i think the challenge is on the one hand given climate change in particular but also the housing affordability and homelessness crisis there's such a need to act with urgency, but we're dismantling systems that took, as you were saying, Dana, you know, more than 50 or 60 years to put in place. I mean, we started sort of reorienting the planning of Los Angeles around the private automobile in the 1920s um, and continue to expand freeways. I mean, there's still proposals on the books in Los Angeles County to expand freeways almost 100 years later. Um, and so to dismantle those systems um, is, if, if not for that urgency, I think we would say would require um, a significant amount of time. And, and also those systems were put in place, particularly this nexus between freeway construction and single family subdivisions, you know, completely thanks to federal subsidy. You know, the federal government in the post-war decades paying up to 90 percent of freeway construction costs and then mortgage deduction, other support for a single expansion of single family construction those things were really cemented in place by, you know, thanks to federal, really generous federal subsidy. Um, it was, there were no American cities refusing to expand their highway networks given how much money was being handed to them by the federal government in the 50s and 60s. So this is the real challenge is the, the, the stubbornness of, you know, the difficulty of dismantling these, these systems and mindsets that have been in place for so long versus the urgency on a climate and affordability basis that are really compelling us to act more quickly. Well, that convergence seems like a critical juncture in a way. I, I was thinking as you were talking about the reparations uh, movements that, are be that have begun across the country and right in Santa Monica where the 10 freeway displaced about 600 black families when it was built from the Belmar neighborhood and others. It would be something that you and I, Christopher, talked about a long time ago, a cool competition and you know, beginning study to displace the freeways to rebuild the housing. Um, now there's a you know, new layer of logic and justice to that, given our recognition of the um, effects the freeway construction has had. But I think we talked originally about like taking over the 90 freeway and uh, trying to take that out of the city. Not unlike what San Francisco did, right? When it took out the 580, I think it was in the city and 
um, you know, allowed the city below it to actually blossom. So as with as with ADUs, and and you mentioned this before, Dana, there was there were a lot of predictions about. Um, you know, apocalyptic predictions of what would happen in neighborhoods if we legalized ADUs, right? And none of them came to pass. As with Alfresco, outdoor dining, you know, when we're able to put these things in place, we find that they really have support in a constituency, even if there are there's a very loud um, component of, of folks who are arguing against things. Um, similarly with freeways, you know, if I wrote a series of pieces at the Times, you know, calling in, in part for the five the, the two, sorry, spur as it comes down from the five to be either removed or turned into a park, similarly with the 90. And the amount, again, the amount of sort of blowback you get from the kind of conventional wisdom about the traffic apocalypse that would follow. But the places that have done it, many, many cities now leading very progressive freeway removal projects, and the Embarcadero is probably the greatest example of that. They did not see, you know, traffic adjusts um, and you don't see the kind of apocalyptic uh, congestion that people predict. So in all of these cases, and as what you were saying about Jeanette Satakana is very true. You have the ability to put things in as a pilot, um, and then and then you realize that the sky that the sky doesn't fall. So I, you know, one feeling a little pessimistic um, about uh, the freeway removal cause. There has been a lot of very uh, encouraging rhetoric from the Biden administration about that. But if you look at the infrastructure bill, where the money is going and the amount of freeway construction and winding that is still being funded and subsidized from the federal level, it's still it's still tough to square the rhetoric with what you can actually win policy support for, unfortunately. Maybe we ought to redeploy ATSAC. Is that what it was called, Greg? To like- It still works. That still works. Traffic around street <laughs> closures that could, you know, show people that, uh, in fact, it doesn't make congestion worse, but, you know, we could make temporary parks and at you know, purpose. I, I, I mean, uh, uh, Salida and her team will describe ATSAC as being why you can have so many farmers markets and special events and oh. all of that's because they're able to very quickly, you know, just book when you're going to close the street so um yeah but no I, I think i think the real issue would be integrating that with uber and lyft and bird and lime and all of that stuff would be i would guess what's what's the future and mm -hmm. and i would think that probably los angeles is one of the likely places that'll happen first because then it's not so much about regulating it it's just about coordinating it I hope people in the audience will raise their hand if they don't feel like using chat to ask a question. You know, Greg, well, we're waiting for people if they do have a question. I, I think we all kind of hoped that the sort of guerrilla innovation of things like Uber um, or maybe Bird more specifically could be a harbinger of other kinds of corporate opportunism that might yield other kinds of advances. But is it just that uh, the street infrastructure and housing is just such a huge investment that we can't depend on the, in, the kinds of innovations aren't structural enough? Like how could we get the, what, why isn't there, why isn't Tesla doing more than just batteries for our houses, for yeah. instance? Well, I think a lot of these things are experiments and they move through pretty quickly and you're never really sure what they're going to do. I mean, Bird definitely, um, you know, brought mo non-automotive mobility to a lot of neighborhoods. That's That goes without saying. You know, when you look at it, what it primarily replaced was walking trips. Uh -huh. I mean, there's some, if you look at some of the data, from studies, it's it's shocking. I mean, there's some like, you know, 500 foot trips that people will take with a push scooter. So, but, but, it's but fun. It, you know, it's a, it's a balance. It's definitely a balance. It's not all good or bad. Well, as sites for experimentation go, I, I mean, 
because Greg and I are on the UCLA campus, but you're over at USC or at Occidental sometimes, Christopher. I think those are the spaces we ought to be testing a lot of these ideas. You know, it's already one of the most pedestrianized spaces in the city. And, you know, people take transit to get here and then walk the rest of the way. Um, it's all mixed use. You know whether or not we have the ability, and and they're kind of like um, city states. You know the kinds of zoning laws that they have to adhere to are much less stringent uh, than other parts of the city. Yep, yeah. and and also uh, I think COVID's a big reset um, uh, because you really have to ask yourself, like on the cloud kitchen topic, like, am I happier ordering? from the restaurant that I like and having it on my couch while I watch Netflix or, you know, or whatever, catch up on work? Or am I happier going out to the restaurant with a couple of people who I like to have a meal with and deciding, well, am I going to get off the couch to go do that? But it, it is a hard reset. Everybody's like Christopher said, has discovered their local neighborhoods in a totally new way and has been reliant on local stores and things in some cases. So, but the question is, what's that gonna turn into? And I don't know, I mean, that's not something you could legislate, but um, it's definitely something that I think, you know, certain developers and, and you know, certain people are trying to tap into rediscovering that part of, of local living. I think, Dana, in terms of your question about campuses, I think it was Jeff Maynaw, the writer, who said that one of the reasons we are nostalgic for our college years is that we have this way of living, you know, that we all aspire to in our cities and have such trouble achieving, which is walkability everywhere, you know, not having to worry about driving. Um, and you mean you said, it wasn't well, the intellectual life and no. vitality? <laughs> no? Yes, that too, of course. But but it's true. I mean, there is, there is um, that little miniature world. Um, and I think I do think the arrival of the subway to Westwood and that connectivity will become a kind of dra gravitational pull that pulls Westwood and, and the UCLA campus back, you know, into the kind of more urban grid. And so it's this is very hard won progress uh, on our transit network. And but, you know, if you imagine not just the regional connector, better connectivity to the airport, a subway along Wilshire, and then ultimately in the Sepulveda Pass, you know, we'll see which alignment we we pick. Um, but bringing institutions like LACMA, like UCLA, really directly into this transit grid, that will then begin to have ripple effects about what the space between Wilshire and, you know, and UCLA looks like in Westwood, of course. And, you know, I think UCLA owns, has a, has a big piece of land, right? at the subway and doesn't have, I mean, we'll see politically if they could actually execute this, but they don't have to follow city height limits. They could build as right. a tower as, as tall as they would like at that site. Um, so I do think as um, these slow but important milestones in, in, in transit infrastructure come online, particularly the subway, Wilshire subway, um, we'll begin to see some ripple effects. Certainly the Expo line has already kind of change the geography of the city in all kinds of ways. Well, about five years ago, I was talking to someone in uh, university, UCLA's central administration, and they showed me a plan that showed where the boring company was going to pop up on the UCLA campus to bring us uh, Elon Musk's vacuum uh, system. I've forgotten now. What was it called? Hyperloop. Um, so, you know, there are uh, lots of transit connections that are strangely uh, in the back pockets around here. I think a lot of people are hoping that kind of transformation that you're talking about will happen and uh, thinking that maybe the smartest idea is to leave options open for possible futures. It would be pretty exciting for all of us. I see Jen here. We're just about any out of time. Do you have anything else you want to add, Greg or Christopher? That I want to get the between two ferns, Greg. That was your system for these conversations. I mean, it's so nice to have you to speak to and to have all the students and colleagues that are in the audience here. Um, thanks to Mariana for getting these things going. 
Yeah, with yeah, that, I know we're close to the 130 mark. Do you all want to close it up? Chris, I cut you off. Maybe you had one last remark. No, no. Thank you, Dana. Thanks, Greg. Um, thanks, Jen. It's really great to be in conversation. And I think even, you know, when I think back to when I got to LA and started at the LA Times, the way that this conversation has changed, thanks in large part to work that Dana, you and folks like you were doing and Greg, um, thinking about this intersection is really the kind of crucial juncture and moving forward, particularly climate work is, um, you know, there's been a lot of progress on that front in terms of how we frame these questions. And and as you said, these these old this old mindset is tremendously difficult to dislodge. Um, had a lot of support and uh, propping it up, lots of institutional support propping it up. Um, but the that was the most encouraging thing for me about the low rise conversations was really understanding and tapping into a conversation that was already happening out there. That's imagining something quite different and as well again importantly willing to make trade offs and willing to even talk about trade-offs, which has been, um, th that's a significant change, I think. You know, what it reminds me of was, was what was happening around Columbia University in the early 90s with the High Line. Huh. You know, faculty members that were involved in changing legislation, thinking about transportation, writers from the New York Times, it's really refreshing to see this happening now in this mix of city official, you know, LA Times writer, academic, policymaker. It's, it's you know, I, I think it's really a great event and a great thing about the city that these kinds of conversations are happening and not just here, but all over the place. That was a Stephen Hall studio, wasn't it? The very first reimagination of the Highline, I think, was a, a, a studio that Stephen Hall led. I, I think it was, but there was a younger faculty member whose idea the High Line was, and I feel terrible, I can't remember who it was, but it was somebody that wrote for Newsline, actually, um, wrote a piece of Newsline about why aren't we using this as a park? Crazy. Let, maybe we'll all be forgotten, but... Um, <laughs> we can only hope. <laughs> we can only hope, but... I you know, I really appreciate being in conversation with you guys. You're both moving the needle in really significant ways. Let's teach a studio together and uh, figure out how to take this conversation another step. Deal. Let's do it. Dana, thank Greg, you. Chris, thank you. thank you so much. Thank you for everyone who attended. Everyone enjoy your afternoons. Thanks, Jen. Thanks, Thanks everybody. everybody.